the NFL scouting combine is over for the 2024 NFL draft prep season and a lot of guys did a lot of impressive things. We're going to talk about how this impacts the Titans draft plans. This is the Music City Audible. Let's get to it. Welcome everyone to another episode of the Music City Audible podcast presented by Broadway Sports Media in partnership with 440 Sports. I'm Justin Graver. With me as always is Justin Mello. And Justin, did you enjoy this year's Combine? I sure did. I mean, every I enjoy it every year in truth, but it also feels like every year these guys are getting bigger, faster, stronger. It doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, it, it does. I'm kidding. It's pre-draft training is just outstanding, right? Like the science available, uh, the training methods, it's crazy. And you're seeing it, the benefits every single year. What an outstanding combine it was. Absolutely. So let's talk about some of the takeaways from this combine. And I want to frame this in the light of like, how does this affect the Titans draft plans, if at all? Because maybe, you know, the combine is... If you're just getting guys on your radar at the combine, you're probably doing it wrong. Combine is to sort of confirm whatever athleticism you've seen on tape. Obviously, the teams get a chance to do the medical checks on the players. They get a chance to interview and talk to as many players as they can. Can we start with something that didn't happen on the field or during the drills? I just want to get your take on this. Malik Neighbors played a silly game where he answered a bunch of random questions about fast food he he wants to eat and concerts he would go to. Multiple choice, so he didn't even get a chance to like say what his actual favorites would be. He just had to pick one of four options or whatever. And it it spit out that his his NFL match or whatever was either the Titans or the Falcons. Ah. And when he was told this, his response was, oof. And then he went on to say, oof, that's tough. And a lot of people interpret it as, oof, I do not want to play for either of those teams. <laughs> but it may have just been a, oof, this is a tough decision to make. But then he went on to say, Atlanta would be cool. Didn't mention the Titans as one of the two options. Titans reportedly met with neighbors at the combine. He did not run. He did not do any of the drills or on He didn't even testing. measure. He didn't <laughs> even measure, right. He's going to either do that at his pro day or just sit on his tape, one of the two. Um do you take anything away from this nonsensical video that was posted on social media? Uh, no, I don't have any takeaways. At the risk of sounding like an asshole, uh, he'll go where he's paid to go. He'll go where he's drafted to go. He's not going to force his way out. Uh, he's not in that position. He's not, a, you know, an Eli Manning top quarter. Like it, it, even then, it was rare, right? Or it is rare still. So he'll go where he's paid to go. I'm not convinced he meant. Oof, both of them suck. Like. <laughs> I took it as probably like, oh, tough decision. Kind of. No, I have no takeaways from it. Titans want to draft the league neighbors at seven. They're still going to do it. Yeah, I totally agree. So let's talk about. I mean, I think we should start with the wide receivers because they seemed like maybe the most fun uh, position group that that worked out, and a lot made about forty times versus the gauntlet times and the short shuttle and the three cone. But the guy who impressed me the most wasn't Xavier Worthy. Hook him. I'm wearing my Texas shirt to support the boy. Four two one combine record insanely wow. fast we knew he was going to be fast but i did not expect him to break the record john ross's record um who broke chris johnson's record although still not 100 percent sure that that was legitimate because there was that Agreed. whole nike island on the line or whatever if he wore it was adidas or not i don't even remember what company sponsored this but i watched the simulcast i posted the simulcast of chris johnson versus john ross on twitter and you're not telling me that Chris Johnson didn't finish in front of John Ross. But anyway, yeah. regardless, Xavier Worthy breaks the record. He flew, but he wasn't the only guy that flew. Adonai Mitchell, also from Texas, 435, the third fastest 40 time amongst the wide receivers. And Brian Thomas Jr., who is a bigger bodied guy, ran a 434, which that might be the most impressive 40 time out of all these guys given his size both of them are big guys though ad mitchell's a big guy as well right i think the True. measurements were fairly similar in fact both of them this is how great this combine was by the way both of them okay ad mitchell and brian thomas jr became the second and third wide receiver since 2015 to be like 6 205 and run a 435 or faster wow you want to guess who the first one was since 2015. DK Metcalf? Yes, DK Metcalf. So pretty good company to be in, right? And we've seen how that's worked out for him. I mean, both those guys, if you're a Titans fan, you were dreaming about getting them at 38, you could probably forget it, right? I think both of them are top 20 picks. You look at the Bengals at 18. I mean, Jacksonville, I think, is a sneaky team that could use a receiver. The Colts, maybe. 
There are a couple of them in that like 12 to 20 range. I'd be shocked if Brian Thomas Jr. and uh, A.D. Mitchell got past number 20 overall. I agree. So we've seen this. I don't know if you've seen this thing going around. It's a speed score. It sort of takes into account your height, your weight, and then what you run adjusts it. Yeah. To try to form like a more comparable measure across different body types. And the guy who registered at the wide receiver position, the fastest speed score was actually Xavier Leggett, who ran a four, three, nine at two twenty one. The big boy. Also quite impressive. I don't think because so many of these other guys ran such incredible times, it kind of got, you know, swept under the radar a it little did, bit yeah. how how well Xavier Leggett ran too. And he's a guy that, you know, probably be there at the top of the second round. I worry about his one year production at South Carolina. I worry Listen, a little he was bit. waiting for Dowell Logans to be the OC. He's <laughs> great play caller. Dowell Logans literally is the guy that unlocked him. He I mean that is crazy. And uh there's a lot of people on Titans Twitter who are big fans of Xavier Leggett. There's a lot of people in the analytics draft community who aren't quite as high on him. Another guy who ran super fast was Lad McConkey, the Georgia receiver, ran a 4.39. That's a He's, crazy time for him. I mean, th- th- this is a really impressively athletic group of receivers. And I bring all this up to say, you know, we've gone back and forth on this offensive tackle versus wide receiver debate for months now. You and I, especially on this podcast, been talking about why there is more value in taking an offensive tackle that high in the draft and how your chances of finding that all pro player are much higher in the top 10 than at any other point in the draft. And all of that is still true. I think what's clear now after the combine, and this was clear before the combine, but really solidified the two deepest groups of players in this draft class are at the wide receiver position and offensive line, not just tackle, but offensive line in general. And it makes me wonder when the run on these two positions is going to happen. And based on everything we're seeing in mock drafts and everything, it feels like four receivers could go in the top 13 to 15 picks. And those four being Marvin Harrison Jr. did not participate in the combine, didn't even do his media appearance at the combine, just (laughs) said, I don't need to do any of this. I'm going to be a top five pick. You guys have fun evaluating each other. Um, Marvin Harrison Jr., of course, Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunze, and Brian Thomas Jr. is really working his way up into that top 15 pick conversation now. If four receivers go in the top 15, every every team in the league could use additional receiver help with the exception of like two or three. And some of those teams are like the Chargers who have had good receiving cores, but their guys are getting older. Or gonna, they're going to cut some of the guys for cap reasons or whatever it is. But I feel like every team from pick 15 to 32 is liable to take a wide receiver if they view them as the best player on their board. Now, the same thing can be said about offensive line and particularly offensive tackle. It's very weak across the NFL. And with such a deep draft, you'd think some teams are going to capitalize on that too. But from my read on all of this, I feel like when you have receivers run this fast, like 4-2-1, before the combine, Justin, would you have had a first-round grade on Xavier Worthy? I was really close. I had an early to uh, – no, I don't even want to say mid. I had an early two. Yeah, and I think that that's probably where everyone was. But – these NFL teams historically fall in love with speed, especially at wide receiver. We saw Ted Ginn, John Ross be the number nine picks overall in the draft. Like guys that run this fast. Was it, was it Darius Hayward Bay? Once Darius time, Hayward Bay was a, like super early. Exactly. He was a top. I think he was like the seventh or sixth pick. Something something crazy top high 10. like that too. Yeah. Um, top 10 for sure. This is just what happens when receivers run that fast. So. I think some of these guys that ran incredible speeds are going to continue to be pushed up the board, and that includes a guy potentially, um, a potentially like Xavier Worthy, of course, who ran the fastest time. But Adonai Mitchell, four three four, could be working his way into that conversation. Roman Wilson, four three nine. I don't think he's a first round pick, but four three nine is fast. Lad McConkey, four three nine. Like these guys could all go late first round, in my opinion, and that just means. When the Titans come up at 38, if they haven't already picked a receiver, a lot of these guys that were projecting as early to mid second rounders, they could be late first rounders. I don't know if that is going to happen, but I just feel like speed pushes receivers up the board. And to me, if you take a tackle at seventh overall pick, yeah, there could be a run on tackles in the mid late to first round as well. But I feel like you're going to miss out on one of these potentially difference-making wide receivers. You could get a guy who's a solid contributor at 38 overall, but if you want a wide receiver one, 
a guy who's going to change how the defense plays your offense, I think you you should take one at pick seven. And that's what the, the indications from Brian Callahan and Rand Carthon are. When all things are equal between offensive line and wide receiver, we want the guy that can score touchdowns. I don't know. We haven't even really talked about Romo Dunze yet, and I've just mentioned a bunch of impressive wide receivers. Well, that's the thing. Like, there, there's not going to be 16 receivers picked in the opening 36 picks or but 38 would you, picks. Would like, you rather have like the fifth, fourth, or fifth best tackle in this class, or the eighth or ninth best wide receiver in this class? I don't think that's a fair question, and I'm going to push back on it because I don't think you're getting the fourth or fifth best tackle at 38. I don't think there's a chance in hell that's what you're getting at there. I mean, three of them, we know the top three, right? Like Alt, Fashanu, and uh, and Latham are all still going to go early, okay? I don't care. They're all going early still. I don't care what anyone says, okay? You don't think Amarius Am- Mims is going really early after those measurements and, and people are in love with him now? You don't think Troy Fatanu potentially now is a top 25 pick based on, you know, having the arm length to play tackle? You don't think, uh, you know, I think t- uh, Tyler Guyton, I think, is still in that first round conversation. Kingsley, uh, Sua Matia, the BYU tackle. Jordan Morgan, the Arizona tackle. Like, all Talia these guys Spulaga, are still, I mean, one of or, those guys is going to be there at 38. Oregon State, Talois Fuaga also is potentially a tackle or right. maybe a guard. Um, <laughs> this is why not a whole lot has changed for me, in all honesty, from the combine. Because I would wager right now that Xavier Leggett and Lad McConkey are there at 38. And so is Roman Wilson, all three of them. Is that ideal? I don't know if that's one of the guys you're hoping for. I don't, I don't think it's going to be A.D. Mitchell, Brian Thomas, or Xavier Worthy. That's what I would have liked initially. Well, that's, that's my point exactly. Is I, I think uh, Adonai Mitchell and Brian Thomas could be wide receiver one caliber players in the NFL. They could be. I don't think Xavier Leggett, Roman Wilson, and who else did you say? Lad McConkey. Lad McConkey. I, I agree. These guys feel more like wide receiver two slot yep. level guy. I mean, Xavier Worthy, I don't necessarily think he is a wide receiver one caliber player with his very slight frame, 165 pounds he weighed in at, which is part of the reason he was able to run 4-2-1. If he came in at 180, he's probably not breaking the combine record. Oh. And he may play at 180, which means he's not going to play at a 4-2-1 speed. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if he's been working for three months to get himself in shape for this 40-yard dash, it's possible that he was playing at a, a slightly heavier weight. But regardless... Uh, he's he's a speedster, obviously. He's a punt returner. He's a deep threat. He can take slants to the house. He can run the screen action and the the gimmicky gadget plays as well. But is he going to be a go-to wide receiver when he doesn't necessarily have the frame, doesn't necessarily have the contested catch ability? I still think he would be a great pick for the Titans to pair with Will Levis with his deep speed. And that leads he's me to my other point. So, so how many wide receiver ones are there potentially in this draft class? And sure, one of these guys later in the draft could surprise everyone Amon Ross St. Brown style fourth round pick and, and go off and be that player. I'm not saying that that won't happen. But to me, I feel the most confident saying that these five players could potentially be wide receiver ones. That's Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, Romo Dunze, Adonai Mitchell, and Brian Thomas Jr. Those guys feel the most wide receiver one-y to me. None of those guys are going to be there at 38. You could get a starting caliber offensive tackle at 38, even if it's not a top five tackle in the class with Bill Callahan. And I know we may be putting too much stock into what Bill Callahan is going to do with these players, but I do think it's worth considering that as well. To me, the ideal scenario might be the Vikings, the Broncos, the Raiders who pick at 11, 12 and 13 want to trade up to number seven. The Titans slide back to that 11, 12, 13 range. They either get J.C. Latham, here saying, is a top three tackle. Or, you know, there's been mock drafts that have floated around the last week or so that have Olaf Ashanu falling that far as well, yep. which would be a huge win for the Titans. Or you take a Brian Thomas Jr. there or Adonai Mitchell if he's really creeping up boards as much as he could be. A 4-3-5, like we can't understate how impressive that is for a guy at his size. And same thing with Brian Thomas Jr., 4-3-4. Four, four. Like those are insanely fast times for how big those players are. They're boundary vertical playmakers. Exactly. And, and they're dominant at the catch point. Very much in the mold of possibly T. Higgins, but faster. I mean, faster, faster than T. Higgins. Like, So my point is, if you can slide back four, five, six picks, pick up either an extra second, an extra third, maybe a future second, future third. Maybe if you get a bidding war going between these three teams, you get one of their, their first round picks next year. And then you go into next year's draft with a ton of ammo. That would be crucial. Take one of these wide receiver one playmakers in that 11, 12, 13 slot and then get your tackle at 38. 
that seems like the most ideal scenario to me. You may miss out on Malik Neighbors, Joe Alt, Romo Dunze by doing so, but how much of a drop off are we really talking about from those three blue chip prospect, if you want to call them that, to some of these other wide receivers that like Brian Thomas Jr. might be better than Malik Neighbors. I'll say it. Sorry, I said it. Wow. <laughs> wow. Might. Might. I'm not saying he is. I'm saying maybe though. You're, you know what? You're doing a pretty good job convincing me. I'm not going to lie because I've been on team tackle at seven the entire time and not a whole lot has changed for me. And it's a boring thing for me to say, but like if we look at the bigger picture, I went into the combine knowing that this tackle class and this wide receiver class was really, really good. And I came out saying, damn, we were all right. The tackle class and the wide receiver class is really, really good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So I I don't I haven't changed opinions too much. I can't see the scenario you're talking about working out. I hate that they don't have a third round pick. Me too. Right? The ties I've said that time and time again. They need tackles and receivers so bad. We've almost forgotten how badly they need corners and uh interior offensive linemen and probably inside linebackers and a safety and an interior D linemen. Like they need so much on this roster. And I really do believe they need all of those positions that I just listed. They got no one to play next to Amani Hooker, no one to play next to Jeffrey Simmons. Zell Shire is a free agent. I can go on and on. No they one to play next to quarter. Yeah, no one to play next to whoever they're Roger McCreary, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and Roger McCreary's inside. So yeah, literally no one to play on either outside. side. <laughs> yeah, both sides. So I can I can get behind trading back to that 11, 12, 13 range. Now I also think as Titans fans, let's not get too ahead of ourselves and say they're definitely going to be able to do that. Right. If people like the quarterbacks as much as we think they do, seven might not be early enough for yeah. those three teams, right? Like quarterbacks are probably going one, two, three. I haven't, I, I still believe that that's going to be the case. And then if you're the Cardinals at four, you probably, you might want to stick and pick and take Marvin Harrison Jr. But if you're the, the Chargers at five, and we, what we just said, you can use any of those tackles. You could trade back and get Fuaga or Latham to play right tackle. Or you might they might like Brock Bowers. They don't have a tight end and, and they have another pass catcher for Justin Herbert. Or they can take one of the receivers we just all talked about, right? Like the Chargers are, are prime trade back candidates from number five. Probably make a better partner than the Titans do because you're going higher up. You probably guarantee that you get your quarterback. So I, I don't think it's a, a sure thing that the Titans are going to be in a position to trade back especially for a QB needy team. If if people love J.J. McCarthy and Jaden Daniels the way they say they do, then seven's probably too late. That's 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 a realistic possibility we have to come to terms with. Um, but I, I think you've sold me enough where as much as I still think, you know, I would stick and pick Joe Alt probably at seven. Um, if you trade back to 13, you pick up picks. We know how I just went through how bad this roster is and you end up getting... Uh, certainly Olu Fashanu, I would I would consider a huge W, but you get a, a Roma Dunze even at 11, or you right. get, I, I I I could definitely get behind Brian Thomas Jr. and, and A.D. Mitchell. Might be a little early taking them at, you know, 11 or 12, yeah. but I, I just called them top 20 guys earlier, right? So uh, I, I think I could get behind it. And to me, like, we haven't really talked about Roma Dunze's combine performance. We've been talking a lot about the wide receivers. I do want to briefly just go into how impressed I was by everything that he did. He wasn't the fastest guy. He wasn't the most explosive in the jumping and testing drills, but he just showed so much fire and competitive competitiveness and will like want to be great. And I'm yep. not saying like, this is nothing against Malik neighbors and Marvin Harrison jr. For not participating. Like I totally understand their reasons for doing so. And I'm not saying that they aren't competitive guys, but you can see the fire in Romo Dunze. I mean, in the gauntlet, he looked so smooth catching the ball. Look, he is. It, yeah. He is so smooth. He's so talented with his hands. And how about this story that he stayed on the field yeah. after everyone was done with their workouts to get a specific time in the three cone drill that he knew he could hit. And now, he wasn't. A lot gonna... of guys aren't even running three cone anymore, by the way. Right. Like, I think you had more than 200 op outs this year of like agility drills and bench press. Like no one does it anymore. And he's just, he like. Again, I'm not saying Malik Neighbors and Marvin Harrison don't want to be competitive guys, but this is a guy who wants to win whatever the hell he's doing. He wants to win. Everyone's pre-draft process is different. And I like that you brought up you're not taking shots at those guys because let's face the reality. I, I th I'm not saying for sure. I don't know. 
But I think if Romo Dunze was in Marvin Harrison Jr.'s position, maybe he'd make the same decision. We don't know. Right. We'd be silly to not acknowledge that part of his process was probably saying, hey, you know what? Take a look around. People read content. Right? The agents, players, they're smarter than they've ever been. They're more aware than they've ever been. He is the consensus wide receiver three, right, behind those two, right, according to the league, according to content, whatever. Um, so the, with the two of them not going, I'm sure part of it was, hey, what a great opportunity for me to take center stage here. I am the best receiver that's participating in the combine. Right. So I might as well go take advantage of my opportunity and see if I can close the gap between myself and them because millions of dollars are on the line, right? Yeah. If I blow a team away and now one of them takes me six overall or seven overall instead of 12th or 13th overall, millions of dollars we're talking about essentially. So uh, I, that does play a role, I think, into the decisions that were made for all three of them. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And it just, it just impresses me. And like, that's a guy that you want on your team. And maybe you're right. You know, if he was in another position, maybe it's different, but he also met with the Titans reportedly at the Combine, so we know there's interest there. I would be fully on board for Romo Dunze at 7 overall. I would be more on board if you can trade back to 11 and still get him. And I don't know if you could, especially after what we saw at the Combine. I think teams are going to be taking a second look at him, not because of how he tested, but just because of that competitive fire and like going back and doing a little bit more digging into his personality, going back to the Washington coaches and saying, like, what what else can you tell us about his work ethic and his competitiveness? Because I think that's what was most on display from him at the Combine. So anyway... He ran a 4.45, if I didn't say that. 4.45, measured That's in standing time. Measured in just under 6'3", 212 pounds, and ran a 4.45. So, I mean, this, he, he like I don't know what it is about him. He kind of reminds me of Jamar Chase. And obviously, we know Brian Callahan had a ton of success with Jamar Chase in Cincinnati. So, anyway, any other combine takeaways? I mean, we didn't talk about defense at all. Titans probably aren't targeting defense, at least with their first two picks, unless they pick up some extra picks. So... I think we're okay not talking about them as much. I do want to ask you one little philosophical question about defense. Feels like, and maybe this is just the like media fan hype because fans love offense more than they love defense, but it feels like it's going to be a very offensive heavy first round. Do, is there any consideration in thinking like we can get one of the top five, top 10 defensive players in this draft class at say 38 overall? Because the first round is going to be so offense heavy that you maybe forego a position of need, whatever you don't do in round one, tackle or wide receiver, think we'll we'll come back to that with our next pick. Let's take advantage of the value that the defensive side of the ball provides and say, take a corner at 38. Do you, is there consideration given to that in your mind? Well, I guess it depends what you achieve in free agency, right? If you added sure. a great tackle or two of them, you know, potentially or... You added a great wide receiver, which I don't know that one even exists, right? Uh, in free agency, um, uh, it's it's on the table as of now. We're doing this in early March, right? But I don't think you're going to get a top five defender at 38. Certainly, uh, more than that will go in the first round, even if it is offense heavy. You're still going to get. Look at what Dallas Turner did at the combine. Yeah. Uh, I think Quinion Mitchell had an outstanding combine. Both of those guys are going top. 15 probably in my opinion i think terry on arnold still going early as a corner and you got a couple others right lot two the edge rusher uh byron murphy the, the longhorns d tackle you're not getting a top five defender at 38 but maybe top 10 probably top 12 uh, uh a corner uh, i'm really intrigued by some of those you know early you know late third round early fourth if, if you mm -hmm. pick up an extra pick pick if you pick up an extra pick in the second round I think you definitely go that route, right? There's a couple of them. I think Kool-Aid McKinstry could fall to the early 30s based on the injury. Uh, Kamari Lassiter from Georgia is a guy that I've liked the, the entire time. Then when you get to the third and fourth round, there are a bunch of guys that I like. Uh, Cam Hart from Notre Dame. Uh, the, the two tackles at Florida State, uh, the names are escaping. I think Jerry on Jones and the, uh, Renardo Green, I think, is the other one. Both are very interesting. The Rutgers kid had a hell of a combine. I think it was Max uh, Melton. Max Melton, yeah. He was outstanding. Like all these guys in late round three, early round four, I think most of them. So uh, Kyrie Jackson from Oregon is, is one that's not getting enough buzz. He had a, a pretty damn good combat. I, I don't get it with him. What people aren't talking more about him. Remember when I said this about Eric Stokes a couple of years ago and he went yeah. in the first round? Like, I don't know that Kyrie will go in the first, but I think he's probably a second. And no one's even saying that right now based on what I'm saying. I mean, the size is there. 
really good production. The guy is like a five-star recruit, played at Alabama, transferred to Oregon for his final year. Really good production at both schools. Like, I don't know what I'm missing on Kyrie Jackson, but he he looks he he looks the part to me. So there are a lot of really good corners in this class that uh, I think there are a couple of them that'll go in round two, that 38 range. I think there's a slew of them that should intrigue the Titans uh, sort of round three onward. Yeah, I agree. So we'll see what happens. I do think as we sit here in early March, like you said, before free agency starts about a week away from free agency, actually, I think wide receiver and tackle are the first two picks. The order is going to be debated nonstop ad nauseum until late April. But uh, is there any indication that the Titans won't go tackle receiver in some order with their first two picks, even despite what you just said about all the defensive players? No, I still think that's the way they should go and the way they will go, right? Nothing changed for me. They're fortunate to a degree, as we said, that the, their two biggest positions of need happen to be the two best positions in the draft. Best thing you can do is take advantage of that. Take yeah. one at seven, take one at 38, because you're going to have good options uh, probably at both positions in both spots, right? Even though I've said many times I'm not super comfortable with the tackles that'll probably be there at 38, there's going to be a guy or two, right? Maybe they love the BYU kid. Uh, he was very impressive at the podium, talking about how he learned how to write with the other hand yeah. at a young age and has taken up boxing and is really big for coordination as a tackle. Uh, the Arizona, maybe Jordan Morgan's there. Patrick Paul from Houston. The measurements are just insane. Uh, if Troy Fatanu's a tackle, maybe he pushes someone like Tyler Guyton down the board as well. So there, there, there's going to be at least one or two good options at both positions at both seven and 38. Yeah. So I think the indication right now is that's the way to go. Yeah. And if the Titans are able to do something like, I don't know, sign Tyron Smith in free agency, who you may not be able to count on him for a 17 game season, but you can count on him to bridge your way to a second, fourth round tackle. Or if they get a third round pick, I think you're, yeah. you live with it a little bit more. You sleep better with that than you would if you were just relying on say patrick paul to come in and be a day one starter but anyway that's it i think for combine takeaways um anything else you want to say about the combine justin the buzz about the quarterbacks the rumor mill the franchise tags and I, I think we can hold off but i'll toss it to you one last time for this episode no again i, I just think it was uh, an outstanding productive week for all for most of the prospects if, you know certainly the majority of them and I think it was a great week for the Titans to get there in person and see all the receivers and tackles that could help fix this offense next yeah. season, right? Because that's what we want above anything else. And I, I'm sure Brian Callahan's very excited about what he saw at those two positions. So the debate rages on, and it's not going to stop <laughs> until the decision is made yeah. uh, in late April. But uh, I think the Titans are in a good position at both spots, and they, they should be excited about the possibilities. If we've learned anything about what's going on in Cincinnati and Detroit, the debate's going to rage on for three seasons after they're drafted. But <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to see how it plays out. All right, that'll do it for this one. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Make sure you are subscribed to the YouTube channel, the Music City Audible podcast. We will be back later this week to wrap up our Titans pending free agent discussion. We're going to run through the 12 pending free agents on the defensive side of the ball and discuss if the Titans should re-sign them or not. And if so, how much should they pay them or what kind of contract should they offer if the guy decides he gets a better offer somewhere else than he walks. But that's what we will do on our next show. So make sure you're subscribed so you get a notification when that pod drops. Follow Justin on Twitter at JustinM underscore NFL. You can follow me at Titans Film Room. Until then, y'all stay safe out there and tighten up. A Broadway Sports Media Production.